Welcome to this recorded CE program from Dense Ply Tulsa Dental Specialties and featuring Dr. William Nudera. You'll see below Dr. Nudera's camera a brief bio as well as several links with some more information on Dr. Nudera and some additional educational opportunities with Tulsa Dental, both online and live. Reminder, one hour of CE credit is offered with this program but you must complete the quiz that was provided when you registered for the course. You'll find that on the website on the course detail page. If you have any questions, you'll see also an email address and a phone number for your convenience. That's ce.info at densepply.com and 800-662-1202 extension 51543. Let's go ahead and turn the program over to Dr. Nudera. I want to thank all of you for joining me today for this online CE event. Today what I want to do is talk a little bit about the initial stages of root canal treatment. It's very important for every clinician to have a dedicated protocol in place so that the treatment process becomes as streamlined as possible. This webinar is intended to help the clinician improve the endodontic treatment result by providing a better understanding of canal negotiation and the steps required prior to creating that final root canal shape. Basically, predictability, that's what we're all after. Well, what does that mean? Well, predictability is the ability, to, the ability to estimate the future result of something. For the purposes of what we're talking about today, that something happens to be the final root canal shaping objectives. Predictable endodontic treatment is the foundation for consistent and favorable long-term outcomes. In order to achieve that predictability, we must have a solid understanding not only of what we're doing and why we're doing it, but that has to be coupled with a consistent treatment approach every single time. The root canal shaping objectives have not changed in four decades. They were first described in 1974, and they include a continuous tapering funnel from the coronal aspect of the root canal system to the apical aspect. They allow for the flow of the original canal shape. We also want to try to maintain that proper spatial relationship of the original apical foramen. We also need to keep that apical opening as small as possible. Just like other aspects of dentistry, endodontics is a compounding treatment process. Each step we take builds upon the previous one. If shortcuts are taken within one step, the overall control of the treatment will be undoubtedly affected. Control of the root canal system starts with obtaining a proper and conservative access design. Now I like to use the word access design as opposed to access preparation. It's my opinion that every step taken is calculated with the long-term result in mind. Just as features are incorporated into the restorative procedures in order to achieve our maximum retention and aesthetic value, there are features in the endodontic access that must be designed to achieve maximum long-term structural support. So we're not just preparing something, we're designing something. Remember, the most important component of the access design is visualization. Traditionally, we have these access designs that revolve around this concept of fully, fully unroofing these pulp chains. This approach creates a parallel or sometimes divergent axial wall from the pulpal floor to the occlusal surface. This approach also encourages the extension of the access preparation into the pulp forms. The idea behind this design concept is really based on visualization and the ability to visualize with straight line access all of the canal orifices simultaneously. When we actually open these orifices, we must start thinking, is this truly necessary to remove all of this dentin every single time? I look back at this radiograph. This was from 2005, and there's nothing wrong with this root canal treatment, and it's my root canal treatment. In fact, there's nothing wrong with it at all. But when we look at this access design, I reflect back on this, and I look and see how large this access was. Did I really need to make this access as large as what we see here? Well, there's been a shift as far as what some endodontists are referring to as restorative driven endodontics. And an argument can be made that with increased magnification, smaller accesses can be designed. This approach conserves dentin while still achieving that straight line effect that we're going for. This new concept in access design creates convergent axial walls from the pulpal floor to the occlusal surface without compromising visibility. 
Visibility of the canals can really be easily achieved by angling or repositioning your mirror to only treat and visualize the canal of interest at the time that you're treating it. So for example, if we're working on a mandibular first molar in the mesial buccal canal, do I really need to visualize the distal lingual canal at the same time? Probably not. But when I'm ready to move on and treat that distal lingual canal, I can then change my mirror angle position and still achieve the access and straight line access that we need, but not necessarily seeing all the canals at the same time. When we look at the dentin at the level of the CEJ, we can see how much conservative dentin that we can maintain by keeping these access preparations small. So when putting these two access designs side by side, it becomes very clear that with this minimal access design, we're able to achieve a more streamlined and restorative driven endodontic access design. So I just want to show an example of what's possible. Now this may not be within the scope of everyone's practice and that's okay, but that doesn't mean that it can't be thought of when we're actually creating these accesses and we just want to have dentin concentration in mind. As you can see, there's absolutely no in the treatment approach or the treatment outcome, yet the access remains small in contrast to what is traditionally accepted. We can see that the access is converging towards the cable surface as opposed to what's traditionally taught. But with all treatment objectives, there must be a reasonable compromise between conservativity and visualization. This sort of access approach is not limited to teeth without restorations. You can see the same concept can be applied to teeth with full coverage restorations. Maintaining a small access through restorations will not only conserve tooth structure, but it will also cause less structural damage to the existing restoration, especially if these restorations are being retained. As of today, most clinicians and tests are still recommending the traditional access design approach, but it is my opinion that we will see, not in our distant future, that the recommendation for smaller access designs will start to overshadow these traditional designs that we're all accustomed to. But visualization still remains a key component to predictable treatment. Occlusal adjustment is also something that can be incorporated into the access design. It's definitely important to consider doing this as part of the access design process. This will accomplish several factors. Number one, it eliminates heavy occlusal contacts, contacts and therefore decreases post-operative tenderness during normal occlusion after the treatment is complete. It also then creates a flat plane for a consistent reproducible reference point. Sometimes I will choose not to make an occlusal adjustment and those times I choose to make that go in that direction are really limited to full coverage restorations that we're planning to retain because any additional preparations we do on the surface of a full coverage restoration can add additional damage to it. I certainly inform the patient that bite adjustments may be necessary, but we reserve that for a later time. But all teeth that do not have restorations that we're trying to retain, or all teeth that are treatment planned for new restorations will all receive an occlusal adjustment as part of my access design. So we use the term leveling the playing field or a level playing field. Well, what does that mean? Well, in my opinion, it means that we're starting to standardize every root canal system before we start taking these large engine driven instruments in to create these final shapes, creating some sort of uniformity to these canals. Regardless of the tooth type or the tooth location, we are actually wanting to have this uniformity across the board. And all my cases are approached in the exact same manner before I start shaping them. If we do this, my outcome is always much more predictable. In order to help me achieve these predictable outcomes, we need to take into account some extraneous factors that might have an effect on this final result. In order to do that, we need to achieve some level of control over the treatment process. So this control process is arguably the most challenging part of the root canal treatment and it's involving four specific concepts and components. Control of the root canal system is easily achieved by understanding these four concepts and it begins with orifice opening, continues with apical patency, then a glide path preparation and recapitulation. Strict adherence to these four concepts and principles will give this predictable result every time no matter what treatment canal, no matter what canal that we're treating during this process.
It's also going to allow this treatment process to be much less stressful and more enjoyable for the clinician. Out of these four concepts, three concepts need to be maintained throughout the entire treatment process. Orifice opening is a one-time event, but obtaining apical patency, creating a glide path, and recapitulation all need to be maintained throughout the treatment process. So we start with orifice opening. Orifice opening really is defined as enlargement of the or opening of the pulp chamber leading into the root canal system. Orifice opening accomplishes three main objectives. Number one, it reduces coronal and sometimes even mid-root interferences. It removes bulk debris from the largest part of the root canal system. And once we open the orifice, if we then establish our working length after the orifice is open, there's a less likely chance that this working length is going to change during our instrumentation process. When we look at orifice opening, it's considered to be a preparation of the coronal third of the root canal system. But I also like to think that orifice opening is an extension of our access design. For this reason, the first instrument that I take into the root canal system happens to be a rotary instrument, which is not typical for what we're taught in school. We're usually taught that that first instrument that enters the canal is a hand file. But for me, it's a rotary instrument. And I'll go into reasons why here in these next few slides. As the root canal system exits the pulp chamber, it can branch at a very acute angle. This layer of dentin that's associated with tra this transition takes the shape of a triangle in, sag in the sagittal cross section and therefore is traditionally referred to as the dentinal triangle. Most depictions and descriptions of this are generally associated with multi-rooted teeth because it's easy to illustrate this effect on those teeth types. But this terminology implies that these triangles are absent or sometimes non-existent in single-rooted teeth. Well, that's not exactly true. There are many cases of single-rooted teeth that exhibit a narrowing of the natural orifice as the root canal transitions from the pulp chamber. Also, based on access design in some anterior teeth, specifically mandibular anterior teeth, an acute angle from the pulp chamber to the canal is unavoidable due to aesthetic limitations. For this reason, I like to call this area constrictive dentin as opposed to a dentinal triangle. That way, it applies to more than just posterior teeth or multi-rooted teeth. An extreme example of this is in this image here of this maxillary first molar, which was treatment plan for root canal treatment. We see the pulp and we see the mesial buccal root and the canal exiting at an extremely acute angle from this pulp chamber. This needs to be observed and needs to be taken into consideration when starting to enlarge this root canal system and address it in order to achieve a predictable outcome. It's not uncommon for me to take over root canal treatment after an attempt has already been made by another clinician. The referral slip will often make a comment suggesting that the orifice was identified or located, but the canal was calcified. Traditionally, canals calcify from the coronal aspect of the root canal system to the apical. Therefore, if a canal was identified and negotiated in the coronal aspect, it's highly unlikely that a mid-root calcification exists. Now, there are always exceptions to these rules, but in general, we don't, don't really see mid-root calcifications. The problem is generally identified as one of two issues depending upon where the perceived obstruction exists. Number one, if the, instruct, if the obstruction is limited to the coronal aspect of the canal, the issue sometimes can be traced back to improper file angulation at the level of this constrictive dentin. If the obstruction presents more mid-root or apical, the issue is commonly related to a restriction of file advancement as opposed to a true calcification. Both of these issues can be resolved by understanding how to manage this constrictive dentin through proper orifice opening as the first step following the access design. The most common types of orifice openers that are used today still, I believe, are the gates, glid, and drills. I used to use them as well but it's been a while since I have used them for various reasons. When I did use the gates, glidden drills, I would always concentrate on using gates number two, gates number three, and gates number four. Number one is way too fragile and sometimes can break the bud, which is very difficult to retrieve. And number five and number six have a maximum fluted diameter of 130 and 150 respectively, and certainly those are way too big based on the conservative preparation designs that we're going for. There 
Some would also argue that gates four at this level is still a little bit too large with a, with a maximum fluted diameter of 110. We have to remember that gates glidens are lateral cutting or side cutting instruments. So even if we are limiting our maximum flutes to what we think to be 110, really with the side cutting action of these gates glidden drills, it's actually probably larger than 110. Some other problems that we face dealing with gates glidden drills is number one, they're old technology. They're very rigid and they're very aggressive. It's an all or nothing preparation when we prepare or open the orifice with gates glidden drills. It's difficult to govern the actual size of the canal with, res with respect to apical advancement because there is no control or no taper on these particular instruments. Looking at this image of the root canal treatment of this maxillary second molar, there's nothing again wrong with the root canal treatment itself. The line, the, the obturation but I'm drawing your attention to the canal shapes. Clearly is a good example of what a Gates Glidden preparation can look like. Is it really necessary to take a Gates Glidden halfway down the root canal system of a palatal root? Probably not. This may be an overaggressive approach as we look at things today. I've used this Pro Taper Shaper X file as an orifice opener in lieu of the Gates Glidden drill. It's the first file line in Densply's Pro Taper Universal series, and it has a lot of advantages built into it, which can't be accommodated with the Gates Glidden drills. Number one, it's a short file, meaning that it measures only 19 millimeters from the actual shank of the file itself. And the tip size is almost equivalent to a size 20 hand file. Actually, it's a 19. So it's short and can be introduced into these more difficult access areas. Number two, it's flexible. It is nickel titanium and allows nice following of the canal system as it's inserted into the canal. It's extremely efficient. It's something called a non-landed file, which means it actually is going to cut the dentin on the side. And the diameter of the working part of the file is equivalent to some numbers that we all should be familiar with. So when we break it down on the working part of this file, we see these fluted diameters, which is equivalent to our gates one, our gates two, our gates three, and our gates four. It was a fantastic transition for me to go from gates glidden use to this particular file because my diameters of the canal orifices after they were open were very comfortable and similar to what I already knew. I used this file for about a decade and maybe a little over that, but this file, if you're going to follow this technique, comes with a very significant warning. This file can be fragile if used improperly. And typically, when we see these files used, and they, they're fragile more or less at the tip because that's the thinnest portion of this file. So if directed or misdirected, it certainly has potential not to be there when you take it out of the root canal system. So be aware of that. I'm going to show a video here. This is a very early video uh, when I was first getting into microscopic videography. And what I'm doing is I'm using the SX file after I explore it with the DG1617 to try to identify a calcified canal. But what I want to illustrate here, and again, the, the video goes a little bit off center, but it shows a very uh, interesting effect of what happens to these SX files if just turned in the wrong direction. So if you're going to use these files as an orifice opener, and those that are already familiar with using these files understand their limitations, but those that are new to this file understand the fragility of this instrument at the tip, and it's not going to be able to withstand small little nuances or bends in any particular direction. So if this one would have happened inside the root canal system, they may have left a piece of it there and left the doctor and the patient both with an, an unhappy, unpredictable outcome. So be aware of the risk if you're going to go in that particular direction. In January of 2013, I decided to replace the SX uh, as an orifice opener in lieu of the new Vortex orifice opener. They were just launched a little over a year ago, and I have really grown to, to rely on these as my orifice openers. The orifice opener that I tend to gravitate to the most is the T with an 08 taper. Now certainly Vortex orifice openers come in more than one tip size, and they come in various taper sizes, but for the purposes of what I'm looking for, the Vortex 2008 really serves virtually all of my purposes. Let's look at some features of this. Well, the total length of this file now is 16 millimeters. They do make a 19 millimeter version if you're more comfortable with the longer file, but the 16 millimeter version seems to be adequate for my needs. 
The tip size is also equivalent to a size 20, only about one hundredth of a millimeter larger than the SX, really insignificant in my opinion. But what's interesting about the spiral is the way that it's designed with re respect to taper. When we look in the mid area, the mid working part of this file, we see the dimensions of 0.52, 0.68, and 0.92, which equivalent to our gates 1, equivalent to our gates 2, and equivalent to our gates 3. But what's really advantageous about this is the fact that as we go from the maximum fluted diameter of 0.92 to the remaining working portion of the file, the taper parallels out. So in no way can we ever prepare the orifice larger than a 0.92 when using this file, keeping it very, very conservative. So some other advantages of this Vortex 2008 is it's made of better, better metal ergy. It's made of M-wire nickel titanium, which is more robust. The tip side isn't as fragile as the SX. So there's more bulk material from D0, which is the diameter at the tip, to D3, which is the diameter three millimeters back from the tip. So I currently am using this file in lieu of the SX as an orifice opener. When we look at these two files side by side, we can clearly see the differences. Maybe subtle to some, but they're significant to me when I'm trying for maximum debt and conservativity. If you are going to follow this principle of opening the orifice as your first step after the access design, there are two rules which you must adhere by. The rule of file advancement, and the rule of file angulation. Well, the rule of file advancement is simple. Basically, if the file is moving, it must be advancing. If the file is rotating in the same spot and not advancing, a ledge can easily be created within the root canal system. The file will follow the natural canal and should advance easily. The file will also engage. You're going to feel it working a little bit, but it shouldn't be pushed or shouldn't be forced. Discipline and patience must be exercised. The slightest push can create a ledge and ruin this case before you have an opportunity to treat it. Basically, this file should slide in very easily if there's actually a canal there. If you have to force it or push it, then it may not be a canal or you may be at the wrong angulation, so keep that in mind. Which brings me to the next rule, which is the rule of file angulation. There's a tendency for clinicians to insert the I want to go apically or straight down once they identify that orifice. But remember, we're dealing with these acute angulations of these canals branching from the pulp chamber. And that may be possible to go straight down in single rooted teeth. But in multiple rooted teeth, with this angulation, we have to take that in consideration. So the rule of thumb is we need to enter that root canal system from the opposite direction of the canal that's being treated. For example, Again, with a mandibular lower molar, if we're working the mesial buccal canal, we want to enter or have the angulation of insertion coming from the distal lingual to accommodate for that acute angle branching from that pulp, uh, pulp chamber. If you don't recognize this, again, we run the risk of ledging, or worst case scenario, we run the risk of perforating. So again, just to illustrate the benefits of this particular uh, technique of opening the orifice, we're reducing mid-root or interferences coronally for sure and sometimes mid-root. We're removing bulk debris from the largest part of the root canal system and we get less effect of the change in working length as we go through the treatment process if the orifice is open prior to establishing a true working length. We're going to look at a video now here. This is a video of a true tooth of a maxillary incisor with a recessed pulp chamber. We're going to start talking about access we're going to start talking about orifice opening here. So when I make accesses on anterior teeth, what I'm going to do is I'm going to aim for the cingulum. Inherently, some clinicians want to make that 90 degree access preparation on that lingual surface. And as a consequence, most perforations on anterior teeth are through the buckle. But if you focus on aiming towards the cingulum, then the odds of you perforating through the buckle are slim. Also, the first step I do is make a little slot right where I want my access to be. And then I look at my orientation in, both the, in all three axes, X, Y, and Z axis, to make sure that my orientation is accurate. Once I'm comfortable with that and I extend my access preparation to where I believe that pulp canal system should be, we use the DG1617 Explorer to identify that we've actually made it to that particular level. An estimate can be made based on your preoperative imaging as to the level you think you should be at. So make sure you keep that level in mind. 
Once we identify where that canal is, I immediately switch to an orifice opener and I blend the access design into the coronal aspect of the root canal system, creating this seamless transition from the pulp chamber to the root canal system. Now for the demonstration purposes, I'm cutting dry, but it's always encouraged that when you're taking any sort of instrument in the root canal system, a canal medium of some sort is present there. We are going to actually look at access preparation now on a multi rooted tooth. Again, another true tooth replica. And these are just three dimensionally scanned teeth that are reproduced in a three dimensional printer. So, for these multi rooted teeth, especially maxillary premolars, we're going to want to aim for the central fossa and make a small little slot preparation in between the active cuts tips. We make a small little slot preparation. Again, we stop. We then check to make sure the orientation is correct in both the X, Y, and Z axis, and then we advance the actual access burr apically to the pulp chamber. Again, a measurement can be determined based on a bite wing image of posterior teeth as to the level of where you think that pulp chamber should be. If you advance to that level and you haven't made it there yet, good idea maybe to stop and take an image and try to figure out exactly where you're at. So in order to maintain a conservative access design, I am going to now switch to a safe ended burr, which is important because I do not want to create any burr perforation. And rather than extending my accesses all the way to those cuffs tips and trying to completely unroot that pulp chamber, which is traditionally uh, accepted, I'm going to conceptualize that the tip of my burr is going to be underneath the cuffs tips, not the shank, but just the tip. And by that way, I'm almost pivoting this burr, creating this convergent sort of access from that bubble floor to the cable surface area. And as you can see with the DG1617 in place, with that concept or that design concept in mind, I have not lost any sort of access, of st a straight line access or visibility to these canals. Then with a canal medium in place, we want to go ahead and start blending the coronal aspect of this root canal system into that conservative access conservative access preparation. And in this example, look at how far this Vortex Orifice Opener 2008 advances into the root canal system. And this again is the 16 millimeter version. We're already well within the mid aspect of this root canal system. And we've reduced a lot of the bulk interferences that are created when this canal exits from the root, the pulp chamber itself. So once we have this access and conservative access, we now need to start visualizing this concept of dividing the root canal system up into three specific levels, a coronal level and an apical level. As these files are inserted in the canal, where these files fall helps aid the clinician in assessing case difficulty level and helps to determine the next course of action. And we're going to address this in these upcoming slides. So once we have this concept, of splitting this canal system in thirds, we now have to have some sort of measurement, some estimated measurement of how long these root canal systems are. And it's best determined with a parallel x-ray and digital radiography. So if we start taking PAs with snap rays, we have the patient hold their finger in place to take these images, we risk foreshortening or elongating the image, which can drastically affect our pre-estimate as far as the length is concerned. So if we use something like an XCP device or a ring device or something that helps us get a more parallel image, it's going to be pretty close in as far as the estimated work compared to our true working length. So when we divide this root canal system up into thirds and compare that to the distance, we now have some sort of idea or measurement as to where these files are going to fall, which is going to help us assess further the case difficulty as we move forward. Most decisions about assessing case difficulty are really determined based on these conventional two-dimensional imaging. Judgments are made based on the perception of this tooth in this flat plane. There are always or could be some subtle curvatures that exist that aren't readily apparent in these two-dimensional renderings. And we have to remember that case selection is a dynamic process. I encourage everyone to start establishing a good relationship with your local endodontist. That way, if you happen to run into a problem that you felt was based on your scope of practice and you run into an issue that's no longer treatable, you already have a team in place that's prepared to help you manage this particular issue. 
the endodontist should be supportive of everyone's willingness to expand their scope of practice because everyone at some point in their career has had to have navigated through the learning curve, including myself. And there's nothing wrong with believing that a case is within your scope of practice on the initial rated graph, but this can easily change back uh, when we start getting to actual canal negotiation. But there's also got to be a way to quantify this. How do we determine whether or not a case still remains within our scope of practice after we've already started this case? And I'm going to propose that case difficulty can further be determined with the initial placement of a size 10 file following your orthodontist. Basically, in the presence of a canal medium, and this can be anything, this can be Prolute, this can be Qmix, this can be EDTA. I generally stay away from sodium hypochlorite still at these initial stages. I reserve sodium hypochlorite as an uh, a irrigation that I'm going to use following the creation of my final shape. But certainly you could consider that at this particular point in time. As long as there's some sort of moisture or medium in the canal, that's what we're going for. So basically a, a 10 file can be inserted in the canal and evaluated as to how far it advances apically. And it's the extent of this apical advancement that helps assess this clinician's what I, what's called the return on investment with respect to time. I'm going to elaborate on that comment here as we move forward with this. But keep that in mind too. We're all wanting to know what our return is based on the time that we spent to treat a certain case. Of 10 files that are available, there are a lot of different types of 10 files out there that you can use. And there's nothing new about these files either. What's in the middle is what we consider our standard K file. It has a square cross section. And it's what most people think of when we think of hand files. But we also have the ability to move in the direction of something called a C file. A C file is very similar to a K file in the sense that it's got a, the a same cross section as well as the amount of fluids per length of the file. A C file is just processed or treated different with respect to its metallurgy to make it a little bit more stiff than your standard K file. And then at the far right of the screen, we have something called a reamer. A reamer is different in the sense that its cross section is triangular. But more specifically, when we look at a reamer versus a file, file being on top, reamer being below, is with respect to the number of flutes per length of the file itself. A reamer has less flutes per file length as opposed to a file. Files are designed to be used in an up and down motion. Reamers are designed to be used in a watch winding motion. Although some people will use files in a watch winding motion, that's perfectly fine. Reamers are much more efficient when used in this particular motion. There's no right or wrong as far as which 10 file you choose to use, and I encourage all clinicians to try both reamers and files and find the one that works best in your particular hands. So once you place this 10 file in the canal following the orifice opening, you're going to be faced with three different scenarios. Number one, the file is going to advance immediately to the apical third. We all love those cases. I wish I saw those every day. But reasonably, we're not seeing those all the time. Second scenario would be when the file advances to the middle, mid third of the root canal system only. And the third scenario is when the advancement is limited to the coronal third. Uh, and that would be maybe at the level of the orifice opening. Well, if your file advanced all the way to the apical third as the initial placement and consistent with your estimated working length, this case is an extremely manageable case for just about any clinician uh, who understands the, the nuances of root canal treatment. If in fact the file stops somewhere before the apical third or in the mid-root area, now we're getting into a bit more of a challenging case. And this may indicate a smaller canal, uh, maybe a coronal or a mid-root interference, or some sort of curvature that's maybe not recognized on the two-dimensional rendering. If that file stops at the level of your orifice opening or anywhere in that coronal third, this spells trouble. This indicates either, number one, an extremely small canal, a significant coronal or mid-root curvature or interference, or it could mean the creation of a ledge based on improper orifice opening. Either way, if you're going to tackle a case where your file stops in the coronal third of the root canal system, Proceed with caution, and these take some advanced skills in order to negotiate and recapture these canals at these levels. So let's address the first scenario here, these manageable scenarios where the file will drop straight into the canal system. Again, these are the situations that we all just love. If that's the case, we have our estimated working length, we place our size 10 file in the root canal system following our conservative axis and orifice opening, and we have it go to our estimated working length immediately. 
that's the case, fantastic. Move on to your next step, hook up your electronic apex locator, and try to determine true working length. And now we can move on to the final steps. But in most cases, we find that we're dealing with some challenging anatomy as far as in, in some, within some respects here. And that's where we start talking about our return on investment. Uh, because we really want to make sure that we are, are investing enough time, but not too much time if we still want to become profitable as far as practice owners and clinicians. So if your file is placed and falls within the middle mid-third, again, it indicates a smaller canal or some sort of coronal or mid-region interference or curvature. So in these scenarios, following our conservative access design and orifice opening, we place that 10 file and it stops about in the middle third. So what do we do from here? And I've got two versions of this. This is what we call challenging version one. And in this particular situation, the first troubleshooting event that I try to do when we have these situations is we try to step down in file size to a size eight. If I can step down to a size eight file and it advances to my estimated working length, then it's okay. Now I know that this can easily be turned from a challenging case to a manageable case. And maybe I just ran into some sort of small little constriction, but we need to still be able to get our 10 file down to our estimated working length. So if I'm able to advance that 8 file further than my 10 file, great. What I just do is we toggle back and forth between our 8 and our 10 until I'm able to achieve that size 10 file to my estimated working length. This is the motion clinically. They're not exaggerated movements. We're not doing these half turns, these full turns of these files. We're limiting the envelope of motion as we're advancing these files apically. And what I'm doing is I'm going to be toggling back between 8 and 10, 8 and 10, with a canal medium in place. Again, it could be Prolube, it could be EBTA, it could be Cumix. Either way, we toggle back and forth until I'm able to achieve that estimated working length with my 10 file. I've done that, what I've essentially done is change this case from a challenging to a manageable case because now we're able to achieve the estimated working length with our size 10 hand file. I then throw on my electronic locator and I start establishing my true working length. So let's say you did that and let's say you still can't get there because that's the problem sometimes and that leads me to another scenario. In most medium or medium large or large canals, the estimated working length is generally achieved with either a 10 or an 8 file. But in some medium small or in some small canals, it may be more challenging to reach that estimated working length. I call this one challenging version 2. Same scenario at the beginning that once we make our conservative access into our orifice opening that the 10 file stops in the mid root and the mid third of the root canal system. And then let's say we try our initial troubleshooting and we move to our size 8. And let's say that 8 doesn't advance much further than our 10. Well, again, this is a much more challenging situation to, to troubleshoot, but it's certainly, we have some situations to resolve these particular issues. And what we want to do is consider something called a passive step back technique in these situations. And what this passive step back technique is intended to do is it helps further reduce our mid root interferences. This is a middle third canal modification technique. And what we're trying to accomplish this, with this technique is to enlarge that mid-root area, which in turn allows smaller hand files to advance further apically with every cycle. So this takes a lot of patience and extreme focus for the clinician. And it can easily be created a ledge if not done properly. This is where we talked about return on our investment as far as the time it's going to take in order to do this. We generally have two types of clinicians that are watching this webinar right now. Those clinicians that are introducing endodontics in their practice to become more profitable, which I completely encourage you to do. Uh, and if that's the case, this may not be one of the cases for you to tackle because this is going to take a little bit more time. And then we have those other types of clinicians that want to really explore every aspect about root canal treatment in order to really understand everything, not even caring about the return on their investment. That. It doesn't matter which clinician you are, but if you're one of the clinicians that really don't want to spend a lot of time or multiple visits, it may not be the case for you. So essentially, what this technique does is we enlarge the middle of the root by successively introducing larger hand files 
at shorter levels within the root canal system, starting with our 8, followed by our 10. Now we introduce a 15 and passively introduce that into the root canal system, followed it by a 20 hand file. So this is a hand filing technique. We go through these cycles several times, and with each pass, the smaller canals will gradually advance apically as these mid-root interferences are eliminated. This may take one pass, this may take five passes, this may take 15 passes. It really depends on how difficult or challenging this root canal system is. But as soon as that size 8 hand file reaches your estimated working length, you now can toggle back between your 8 and your 10 until the 10 hand file achieves that estimated working length. We're going to see a video demonstration here of this passive step back technique. So what we're doing is I'm working in the mesial buccal canal of a maxillary molar tooth replica. And as I insert the size 10 file following my initial access design and orifice opening, we can see that my 10 file came up a little bit short. Now certainly we can start pushing this, but that creates damage create potential ledges, and basically the initial phases of root canal treatment should be as passive as possible. So if in fact that 8 file also comes up short, the next file I take in there very passively and just working it very lightly in the middle of the third of the root canal system is a size 15 file. Then we then continue and increase the file diameter to a size 20 and insert that at a level that it goes passively. And then we work it a little bit. By doing this, we're essentially removing some of these mid-root interferences. Once we've gone through the cycle up to a size 20, we then start over with the process. Notice the canal medium in the root canal system, and I'm always introducing irrigants of some kind to remove excess debris that gets created during the filing process. So now I'm going back, this is my second pass with my eight hand file, very passively inserting it. You can see it goes a little bit further than it did before, and that's the goal of this treatment. We're not Hurrying up to get to the apex, we just want it to advance a little bit further. Being patient as a dentist is a very difficult thing to do sometimes, and I understand that. So the 10 file again is next, advancing a little bit further than it did before, but not quite as far as my size 8. Going now back to a 15, lightly instrumenting that middle root, removing these mid-root interferences, moving again to a size 20. Again, passive step back, not active step back. We're only inserting these files to where they passively go. So after the second time through the cycle, again, it's always important to irrigate, remove that debris that's cre created by that filing process, because that certainly can have the potential to block the clinician out. So this is the third pass now at the 8. You can see it's advancing just a little bit further down that root canal system. We're almost there. We are all tempted at this area to start pushing a little bit, because we just want to get there. It's only just a little bit more, but I encourage you. Have that discipline. Have that patience. When it's not a race to get to the apex, because the faster we try to get to the apex, the more risk we, risk we are at at damaging the root canal system by creating ledges or creating our own canals. So again, third pass through the cycle. Each file is successively advancing just a little bit further than it did before. You can see that this can be a very time-consuming process if we have a canal configuration that dictates that this technique is necessary for multiple canals in the same tube. So this can take a lot of time. I do assure you though that with practice it does get easier and does get more efficient. So now this is the fourth pass with my size 8. Easily now I'm able to achieve the length without pressure, without force. So just by reduction of the mid-root interferences with just a little bit of light hand filing in, in rotational movements, uh, or I'm sorry, reciprocating movements, it's very easy to passively advance the size 8 file to our length. Once we have that 8 file there, we then toggle back and forth if necessary, but a lot of times that 10 file advances very easily to that same level. So a very easy way to troubleshoot a challenging situation where that file happens to stop mid-root or significantly coronal to your estimated working length. Third scenario is when your file is limited to the coronal third of the root canal system. Well, this, again, as the word implies, spells trouble. This has an extremely poor return on our investment. This requires extensive, and when I say investment, investment in regards to time, this takes a lot of time to alter and correct. Uh, 
it really requires some advanced techniques that we're really not going to get into with today's webinar because we really don't have a lot of time to discuss all the techniques involved with correcting an issue like this. Maybe in a future webinar we can look into it. For the purpose of this webinar, we're not going to get into that detailed approach. But what are some possible causes of why this would happen? Well, number one, we could have created a ledge with an orifice opener during the initial phases, and that's a risk. So if we're going to go with this particular technique, we are taking on some level of risk. And that's why file angulation is important, that rule, and that rule of file advancement. They're critical if you're going to follow this particular concept. But another possibility is we're dealing with an extremely small canal. Maybe we have this coronal or mid-root interference that's very high up in the root canal system. Maybe this is one of those exceptions to the rule where there is a calcification that's beyond the coronal aspect of the tooth. It's rare and it's odd, and that should be able to easily be identifiable on imaging, but certainly sometimes we don't see everything on the image that we like to see. Another possibility is the ability of a canal split. Well, there's a bifidic happening here. Maybe there is an issue with that which is causing the file to stop. So there's a lot of various why we may have this particular issue. But either way, uh, we're not going to get into details on how to, to, how to address this at this particular time. So once our size 10 file has achieved that estimated working length, it's important to determine our, our true working length. This can only be done with an electronic apex locator. These electronic apex locators are fantastic. They are able to allow a very accurate reading and measurement of this true working length of the root canal system. And the literature even says that the reading that we get from our apex locator is more accurate than estimating the working length with the naked eye. Establishing a true working length is only achieved by achieving something called apical patency, which draws us back to those four control factors. Apical patency, basically the definition of patency is the ability of being open or unobstructed. And we're using this in reference to the apical foreman in these particular instances. And again, it's achieved in conjunction with identifying the true working length. So basically, apical patency is also a prognostic indicator for successful treatment outcome. This is what I mean by apical patency. Yes, we're over-instrumenting these root canal systems beyond the physical root of this tooth. Only slightly, only about a millimeter, maybe a half a millimeter. And there are still some clinicians out there that are a little bit nervous about doing this. Be aware that this particular technique is now being taught in the textbooks from 2008. It's being taught in all endodontic programs. It's being taught in dental school. So really, we need to do this in order to achieve these predictable for those that are really interested in understanding all the importance of, of having patency in endodontics, I'm going to refer you to this article. Basically, if you just do a, an internet search under endontology and put in the importance of patency in endodontics, you're going to get this really nice article. It's a very easy read. It's uh, in PDF format and outlines 11 specific reasons why apical patency is important in endodontics. I'm going to illustrate three reasons why I feel it's important. Number one, we're loosening debris at the portal of exit. Now, a lot of times when we're instrumenting the root canal system, we have that true working length. We established it. We confirmed it radiographically, but yet we continue to lose length sometimes because apical debris will get packed in that area. Well, if we always keep this debris loose and always maintain this patency throughout the treatment process, the odds of that happening become slim. We're also cleansing the biologi biologically cleansing the apical region. And as I stated earlier, it's a prognostic indicator of a successful outcome. Again, this is my example of apical patency. And I tried to establish apical patency up to a size 20 hand file. Yes, meaning I'm taking a hand file of size 20, about one half to one millimeter beyond that root apex. This is what allows me to achieve my predictability. When reading the electronic apex locator, this is how we, we read it in order to achieve and determine that we have our proper patency. As we advance that file down the root canal system, we start seeing it go, the little line go, and we start hearing the alarm beep, and then it sounds. Once that alarm sounds, that means that we've gone beyond the confines of that root canal system, and then we have to back that file up until we can see a solid line with one blinking line on this specific electronic apex locator. Once we have this measurement, I will then subtract one half to three quarters of a millimeter from this particular level, and that becomes my true working length. You can subtract a quarter millimeter. You could subtract a millimeter and a half. It makes no difference what you choose to subtract as long as you're comfortable with the level of where you're treating this root canal system. My comfort zone is one half 
to three quarters of a millimeter subtracted from this reproducible reference point in the apex locator reading. I'm also going to encourage every clinician to confirm radiographically the working length. Again, the electronic apex locator is more accurate than reading with the human eye, but it's always nice to understand what the actual what the file is doing in the canal at that particular electronic apex locator reading. There are some canals that you're going to treat that no matter what you try to do, you always run into this dead end, these areas that you can just not advance any further. And we also have to understand what the difference is between a resistance of the file advancing and a dead end. A dead end basically is an abrupt stop, and I guess a good analogy that I can use is when we're giving our inferior alveolar injections. We all have hit bone before, and we should be hitting bone with them. That kind of gives us an idea of where we're at. That solid stop as that needle hits bone is the same feeling of a dead end when we actually place an instrument in the root canal system, which is different from resistance. Resistance means that the file slows down and starts resisting advancement not fitting loose and coming up to a dead stop. There are two differences with these. So when we talk start talking about dead ends, we approach them differently than how we deal with resistance. Resistance, as we looked at with challenging version two, resistance is dealt with through passive step back. Dead ends have to be dealt with in a different version. Why do we run into these dead ends sometimes? Well, let's look at this mandibular molar to true tooth replica, specifically this mesial buccal root. Look at all these curvatures that this canal is going to go through. And certainly, when we run into issues uh, around the apical area, there's a reason. Now, I don't do a lot of pre-bending my files prior to the initial placement. I'm putting them in there straight because these files are flexible enough to follow some subtle curvatures. But when we have areas of multiple curvatures, well, file bending then becomes eminent as far as navigating around these dead ends. So as we put this straight file in the root canal system, you can see that it's stopping right there. If we were to take, right in the apical area, if we were to take a working film of this right now, our working film would give us a clinically acceptable result, but we still have not yet achieved patency. If I push the file here, I, I risk creating my own root canal system, I risk creating a ledge, and I'm not able to recover or gain my patency. And I fight very hard for apical patency. I want it. I know if I don't get it, I get a little bit nervous. So how do we navigate around this? Well, we can treat this by placing small bends in the apical one or two millimeters of these files. Not long sweeping bends, not long hockey stick bends, but very short bends in the last few flutes of these files. These are the only types of bends that are going to allow us to navigate around these specific dead ends, especially in the apical area. You can also see that silicone stopper has a little notch in it. Sometimes they have little black lines on it. You want to line the stopper up with your bend so you always have a visual concept of where this bend in the file is as you're advancing this into the root canal system. These are the types of bends that are going to help you out in these particular situations. These types of bends on the, on the right of the screen aren't going to do you too much good. Sometimes there are bending devices that are available. You can use your cotton forceps. You can go to Home Depot or any hardware store and buy a, uh, a needle nose plier. You can use your bird beak plier for orthodontics. There's a lot of different things you can use to bend these files very, very finely. Uh, it's difficult to use your fingers to do this, so you're going to have to have some sort of device or something else that's going to be able to create a fine bend. But going back to the same tooth, we now have that small little bend with the silicone stopper lined up with that bend, and you're going to work it into the canal system. You're going to run into a couple more uh, impediments in that canal system, so just back the file up, turn it either clockwise or counterclockwise, and then readvance the file apically. Anytime you run into a, a spot in the canal where you cannot navigate beyond, back the file up, reposition it so that bend is at a different location. And you should be able to passively navigate around these dead ends very easily. Now, it's easier said than done. This technique also takes some practice, but it's the troubleshooting that we're doing in order to achieve these ap the apical patency. Once we're able to establish that apical pain, so we go on to our third element of control, which is the creation of a glide path. The only, this is only possible once our true working link has been established. And in simple terms, the glide path is nothing more than a glorified pilot hole. When we're relating this to the anatomy of the root canal system, a glide path, all it does is slightly enlarges the lumen of the existing canal. That canal is already there. We're just enlarging that lumen only slightly. 
It's important, again, at this point, to have a medium in the canal. Our, I'm sorry, prolube.qmix, uh, EDTA. You can consider sodium hypochlorite at this point in time, and certainly there's nothing wrong with it. Again, my philosophy is I'm not aggressively using hypochlorite until that final shape has been created. So the act of creating this glide path is considered an act of step up. We're actively increasing the diameter of the canal at a constant level. That constant level is our true working length. Traditionally, this has been done by hand, but with the advancement of technology, engine-driven files are now able to be used to create glide paths. So when we start looking at our glide path options, we basically have two. We do it by hand, or we do it more efficiently with engine-driven instruments. So of these choices, the choice of creating something or creating a glide path by hand or going in the direction of engine driven instruments is based on the ease of the apical advancement or the difficulty of the apical advancement of again our size 10 hand file and that goes back to the initial placement of that size 10 file remember either it was challenging it was manageable or it was trouble so we can use those same concepts in order to help determine the direction of a glide path option so based on that concept the the ninth number 10 hand file is either loose at length, it's going to fit snug at length, or it's going to be challenging to reach length. So based on these particular criteria, it's going to help guide us as to which option is best for us to create this glide path. So let's look at the two extremes first. First of all, again, fitting loose at length. This is probably the most efficient way of creating a glide path and cost-effective way of creating a glide path because the glide path is naturally already there in these large canals. And all we're doing is going to be verifying the presence of this glide path and we're going to be verifying it by the use of hand files. So this is reserved for larger canals, mainly single canal teeth, sometimes the distal roots of mandibular molars or the palatal roots of maxillary molars. And basically, this technique involves using a 10, a 15, and 20 hand files in sequential order until a size 20 passively reaches this confirmed or this true working length. Patency is important with every single one of these files. So each one of these files, if we're going using this concept, is taken one half to one millimeter long. You could use files or reamers at this point. It makes no difference. But using, again, hand files to create or confirm the presence of a glide path is only recommended in large canals. And again, this argument can be made that the natural glide path already exists in these larger root canal systems. The clinician is not actually creating and engaging the files in these instances, but they're actually confirming and verifying the existence or the presence of it already. So looking at glide path preparation by hand in this single rooted mandibular premolar, again, after the conservative axis has been designed, we then enter in with our Vortex 2008 orifice opener to blend that access design into the coronal aspect of the control coronal third of the root canal system. So this is a fairly open canal. So after that, after that uh, orifice opening has been uh, created or designed, then we actually irrigate, removing that debris, and we introduce that size 10 file. Easily it falls right down to our estimated working length. We can establish that true working length, and it fits fairly loose at length. So I, do I need to rely on engine-driven instruments to create a bit glide path in this instance? Probably not. You certainly could as one part of your streamlined approach, but taking hand files in there, confirming its presence is just as easy too in some instances and can be more cost-effective for the clinician. So my goal, if we're doing the hand file glide path preparation, is to establish a point where I can get that 20 hand file to become patent by about one half millimeter. So you can see in this particular example, it didn't take too much effort to establish a reproducible glide path by hand. Well, now let's look at the other end of the spectrum here. When we have these challenging canals, these really challenging canals, an example of that may be in that, that version two where we had to use that passive step back technique. When I know it was difficult for me to reach that true working length or that estimated working length even with a 10 hand file, I know that I'm dealing with a more challenging routine system. So I'm going to want to choose a different approach because taking hand files, if I had trouble getting my 10 to length, I certainly am going to have trouble getting my 15 to length by hand, and I'm certainly going to have trouble getting my 20, length, 20 to length by hand. So I'm going to use a more efficient way of creating a glide path, an engine-driven option. And for these really, really challenging cases, I'm going to go with the path file series. The path file series 
uh, is a series of three nickel titanium rotary files with a .02 taper, which is the same exact taper as our hand files, and they're designed to use in a sequential order. They're recommended to be run at 300 RPM, and they're available in 21, 25, and 31 millimeter sizes. These files have been available on the market for several years, and I'm very, they have very positive feedback, and they work very, very well. In contrast to the stainless steel counterparts, path files create less canal transportation, so they're more advantageous for curved canals, especially significant curvatures. They're way more flexible than our hand files, and they're way more efficient than our hand files. The only disadvantage to going in this particular direction is the addition of three files to your armamentarium. But sometimes with the predictability that you can get based on treating these torturous canals, the addition of these three files may be well worth it. So with these path files, the tip size is increased at three hundredths of a millimeter. So we're going from a size tan file immediately to to a path purple, which is a 13, then to a path file 2, which is white, which is a 16, then a path file 3, which is yellow, 19. So we're successively, incrementally enlarging the diameter at the apex of this root canal system. When I use these, I use all these files within these series. I do not skip file sizes. There's a reason why I'm choosing these particular files to enlarge my glide path. It's because I want a gradual enlargement of the glide path. I don't want to abrupt enlargement of the glide path. These are cutting at the tip, at the end and the apical millimeters of these files. They're safe ended files, but they're actually their action is within the apical three millimeters of these files. So they certainly are subject to abuse and binding. So you really have to make sure that you follow one rule if you're going to use these path files. And this prerequisite is the fact that we must have these files fitting the 10 file fitting super loose before we introduce path file number one. What do I mean by super loose? Well, here's a video example of what I consider to be super loose. A 10 file that doesn't meet resistance, that flows in and out of that root canal system, that's patent, that uh, is very, uh, can go in and out very, very easily. That's what I consider to be super loose. So taking a 10 file and making this super loose situation is going to make your path file insertion more predictable and easier. So we're going to look at this, again, a true tooth replica of a mandibular, or I'm sorry, a maxillary molar. We're going to look at that mesial buccal root. Look at the curvature on that mesial buccal root. This is a situation where creating a glide path by hand would undoubtedly ruin the actual case before we get a chance to get it to work. So for the demonstration purposes, I've removed the palatal root to observe this mesial buccal root. Again, following our conservatives to do our orifice opening with our vortex orifice opener 2008. We can see that acute angle. We're always going to be doing this in the presence of sort of fluid or canal medium. Again, it could be RC prep, EVPA, Q-mix, hypochloride if you want. So the first thing I do is I'm going to insert a size 10 hand file. Again, this is a straight 10. There's no curvature. You can see that the 10 file is flexible enough to follow the natural curvature of these, of these canals to an extent. But we're also running into a little bit of a blockage right here. Blockage not due to the calcification, but due to the abrupt curvature. So we're going to use our file bending techniques. We're going to bend a little uh, notch in the apical portion of these flutes. We're going to align our silicone stopper so we conceptually know where this file is, uh, the bend is at. And we're just going to work it in clockwise or counterclockwise turns until we're passively able to go beyond the level of this curvature. Once we've done that, I typically am a little bit more aggressive with my patency on these dilacerated roots. And again, a treatment like this may be out of the scope of some of watching this webinar, but I'm mere, more or less giving you a thought process of how I manage these particular curvatures. So it's certainly, if this is not something you feel comfortable doing, I encourage you to refer these particular cases out. But this is a case where I would choose to go in the direction of using the path file. The first path file that I insert is the path one. <coughs> Excuse me, to the path one. And you can see that I'm actually becoming patent with these path files. They're O2 tapered files, very similar to our hand files. And I'm aggressively being patent with these files. That's how I manage these dilacerations. I'm not worried about apical damage to these areas. The patient responds very favorably to these particular situations. If I'm not aggressive with my apical patency, I may not have made enough room for my next file to advance to the level I want it to. So I go through the entire series of path files all the way to path three, and that's created that glide path now for my larger engine-driven instruments to follow. 
So now let's look at the most common examples of where this, the size 10 file is going to fit snug at length. It reaches the length, may, may not have too much trouble reaching the length, but still fits a little bit snug. And again, I would consider this to be mostly the average of canals that, that we treat. And for these situations, an engine-driven glide path option is a much more efficient way than trying to create a glide path by hand. A clinician may not want to add three additional files that are with this path file series in, into their, their sponges. So we now have a, another option that we can use that uses engine-driven glide path uh, potential. And although we can never really fully stray away from the use of pan files, we can eliminate our reliances on them as we continue to move forward with our technological advances. For that, we have a new addition to the product line that was just introduced in February of 2014, and that is something called the Pro Glider Files. And if you're one of those clinicians that wants to minimize your use of hand files, Pro Glider is a reasonable and logical option to consider. Basically, what a Pro Glider file is, is a single file engine driven glide path technique. Uh, that allows for a very predictable and efficient way to standardize your root canal system. So when we look at these pro glider files, they're made from N-wire nickel titanium and they're engineered to run at 300 RPM with a torque control set at about two, between two and 5.2 Newton centimeters. They are 16 millimeter, or about a size 16, equivalent to a size 16 file at the tip. And in the first, in the apical three millimeters, they have a 0.02 taper, which is very similar to the hand files that we are currently using. But what's unique about this pro glider is as we advance through the working portion of this file, we now have something called a variable taper. Variable taper allows more of a flare as we increase to the, what we call D16, or the diameter of the file at 16 millimeters back. In addition, these files are made of M wire which adds some additional benefits and include, improves a greater flexibility, increased resistance to uh, cyclical fatigue. So there's really a lot of technology that's built in this particular file. For those clinicians that aren't familiar with something called this progressive taper concept, this image illustrates the geometry of the ProGlider in contrast to your standard fixed tapered files. So this term progressive taper implies that the diameter of this file and even the taper of this file, I should say, increases at, in direct proportion as the file increases from length at D0, which is the diameter at zero, to D16, which is the diameter at 16 millimeters back from the tip. This is in contrast to a fixed tapered file design where the file increases from that D0 to D16, 16 millimeters back at a constant rate. You can see the difference in the flare of the Pro Glider versus that, that regular O2 taper that we're used to. Well, why does this matter? What difference does this make? Well, the most important advantage of this variable taper design lies with its further reduction of these mid-root interferences. This Pro Glider will not only establish a consistent reproducible glide path to the apical terminus, but it will also allow larger tapered shaping files to gain access to the apical third of the root canal system with less resistance due to that subtle enlargement of the canal in that mid-root because of that progressive taper design. When we look at what a stainless steel file will do when we try to create glide paths by hand and curved canals, we create uh, this, this sort of transportation of the root canal system and doesn't respect those canal shaping protocols or principles that were described uh, four decades ago. When we use pro gliders or engine driven instruments to create the glide path, we have much more respect of this canal's natural anatomy. So when we look at a side-by-side -side comparison from a stainless steel hand file uh, glide path preparation to a rotary engine driven nickel titanium M wire pro glider preparation, we further, it further reinforces two of the four described shaping objectives. We have that flow of the original canal shape, and we maintain that proper spatial relationship of the original apical forming. Now, looking at the Pro Glider, uh, we're going to show another example of, of how this is used clinically here. So we're going to use a premolar true tooth replica. Uh, again, we're doing this with a canal medium in place. This, again, ProLube, Qmix, EDTA, sodium hypochlorite. We advance the size 10 following our access and orifice opening, and again, it's fitting snug in the apical area. So not something I really want to spend a lot of time creating a glide path by hand, not something I want to add three additional files to my sponge with the, with the path file series. So this is an excellent example of where the Pro Glider 
comes in very handy as a one file technique to actually create a reproducible and consistent glide path. So we measure these flow gliders to our working length and we introduce them into the canal. We can advance it in one motion, but again, a gradual fluid motion as this file advances to our three working length. And I'm not shy with these files. I'll become patent with these. Again, the tip size is 16, which is equivalent to a size 15 hand file. And being, seeing how the taper of the apical third of this file is the exact same taper as a size 15, there's nothing wrong with making, maintaining an established patency with this particular file. And I do that on a daily basis in my clinic. So again, a very nice, predictable way of creating a glide path very easily. I'll occasionally uh, go in with a size 20 hand file just to make sure I can maintain patency with a size 20 hand file because that's what's part of my particular protocol. You don't have to do this. This is what I like to do. You can theoretically move right to your final shaping after the pro glider, but just to stay consistent with my concept and my technique, I am going to try to establish to a size 20 hand file. But after achieving uh, patency with a pro glider, moving back in with a size 20 hand file is, is pretty straightforward. This illustrates a bell curve of cyclical. On one side of the curve, we have that extremely challenging anatomy that we showed you before. On the other Side, we have those large canals where things fall in pretty easily. But for most of the canals that we treat, it falls under this, this uh, main portion of the bell curve here. So it's not unreasonable to consider the pro glider as the main option to create most of the glide path uh, for most of the cases that you treat if you're looking to streamline your, your treatment process and glide path preparation. This leads us to our last phase, our element of control, and that's something called recapitulation. Recapitulation is renegotiating canals with smaller diameter hand files in order to loosen debris that forms throughout the canal shaping process in response to canal enlargement. Basically, any time engine-driven instruments are used to enlarge the case, debris is created. That dent and debris is termed dental mud. Most of the debris that we create is augered out based on the union of these files, and it's augered out coronally, but inherently some of that debris will get pushed in front of the file. This dental mud needs to be addressed or we will continue losing length throughout the course of our treatment. The way we address that is with smaller hand files. We get in there and we loosen up this dental mud with size 10 hand files. You can even use size 15 hand files if you want to. If you do not address this dental mud that gets blocked in the apical area and you address it too late, you run the risk of creating your own file, blocking yourself out, and it becomes very difficult to recapture or manage a case when it becomes this uh, veering from the original canal anatomy. So no matter what glide prep preparation you're choosing, recapitulation becomes a critical component to help keep that canal open. Recapitulation is also a very important component during that larger engine-driven uh, shaping technique. We always want to go back in and recapitulate. When we recapitulate, we recapitulate with patency, and that helps us maintain our glide path. So all of this is done all at the same time. We're maintaining these concepts of apical patency, glide path by the process of recapitulation. So based on the geometry of the dimension of these files alone, if a size 20, or what I consider a size 20 equivalent, which is the path three, can reach this estimated working length, it's fair to say that the canal will have the minimum diameter dimensions, at least these minimum diameter dimensions, are parted upon it. These minimum dimensions, these are the minimum dimensions that I need before I will take in any larger engine-driven shaping file into the root canal system. And this is the most difficult part of the root canal system. If you can accomplish what we just talked about, the rest is going to become automatic. So essentially what we've done by creating these minimum dimensions within the root canal system is we have leveled our playing field. By demanding and creating these minimal canal dimensions, with whatever glide path techniques work best in your hands gives every canal uniformity. This will eventually become a ritualistic process if you keep in mind and do this all the time. The beauty is, by adhering to these initial core concepts and principles, any final shaping technique can be used to create the final root canal shape. And you should use those final shaping files according to the manufacturer's recommendations. Root canal treatment is undoubtedly, it remains the most, one of the most challenging aspects of modern dentistry. By taking the mystery out of the treatment process and with a solid understanding of what these files are actually trying to accomplish, the clinician will be more apt to making sound clinical decisions and in turn, they are more likely to establish this predictable treatment outcome. 
With that, I would like to thank you for your particip participation in this online webinar, and I really appreciate your support. I encourage questions, and I will do my very best to address any question that comes my way. So with that, thank you very much. Dr. Nudera, uh, thank you very much again for a great presentation on Access Design and Clyde Path, uh, and many great insights along the way and, and throughout. Um, I would think, maybe just for clarity, that this level of discipline and access and preparation, you're probably saying that um, a clinician is really set up for then just about any shaping protocol uh, of their preference from this point on in the root canal treatment. Absolutely. Okay. That's the beauty of this particular design is we can choose whatever final shaping files that we want to use. As long as we establish the canal dimensions and adhere to those protocols, the options are based on the individual clinician's preference. Excellent. Well, I'll remind those uh, viewers, listeners, uh, again, about completing the quiz that was provided with the uh, course. And that, again, is found on the course detail page on the website when you registered. Uh, we'll need that quiz for the CE credit. And also for you to seek uh, our website, any more great educational offerings, both online and live, uh, many of which you'll probably find include Dr. Nudera in our chair time player and even in our other on-demand webinars. Uh, once again, your points of contact for questions would be ce.info at densply.com or 800-622-1202, extension 51543. And with that, we'll wrap up. And once again, Dr. Nadera, thank you so much. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. And again, I appreciate your support throughout this course.